morning. My name is Marquelis Williams, and I want to thank you for tuning in this morning with us. At this time, we will go through our weekly events, so you will have the opportunity to worship with us during this upcoming week. Leaders meeting will be today for all those who are inspired to be a Bible Talk leader at 1 p.m. This Wednesday, we will have men's midweek for the mighty men of Gainesville. And for all who want to tune in, this will be Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. This Thursday, we will have Campus Devo for all the fired up campus disciples. And for those who just want to tune in, it's going to be this Thursday at 8 p.m. And we have a special treat. This upcoming Saturday, we will have a singles devotional at 7 p.m. Of course, next Sunday, we will be here on YouTube for our live stream. Please subscribe, click like so more people can tune in for our services in the coming weeks. Now, at this time, we will have a few songs. And I want to let you know the words will be on the screen. So please sing along, give your full hearts to God, and just enjoy God's presence as we're able to worship Him. Following that, we will get to hear our dear sister Megan Nelson share her heart for the communion portion of our services. Hopefully you have bread and juice with you so you can take communion with us. And then after that, we will then have a, co a contribution message hosted by Brandon Gabos. He's going to preach the word powerfully. And then, of course, we're going to have the sermon preached by our dear brother Joe Mack. Hopefully you have your Bibles, your pen, and your notebook ready so you can be fully invested in worshiping God today. Now at this time, let's say a prayer for our service. Please bow your heads with me. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord Almighty, that we thank you so much for the opportunity that you've woken us up today, that we're able to have this time to just worship you, the fact that we're able to come before you, to give our full hearts to you today, and that we're able to just worship you uh, with each other. And that we just thank you so much for this opportunity. We just pray so much for service today. Please be with those who are speaking today. Please be with those uh, who are just uh, singing their hearts out for us. And please be with us as we sing hearts and sing with all of our hearts to you, Father, as we give our full hearts to you. We just thank you so much for all that you've done for us. Thank you so much for this time. And we just pray that it's an incredible service. In your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Up next, we're singing What a Fellowship. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, leaning on the everlasting arms. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning on my Jesus, leaning on my Jesus, 
leaning on my Jesus, leaning on my Jesus, leaning on my Jesus, leaning on my Jesus, leaning on my Jesus, leaning on my Jesus, leaning on my Jesus, leaning on my Jesus, my Jesus, my Jesus, leaning on my Jesus, leaning on my Jesus. My Jesus, my Jesus, leaning on my Jesus, leaning on my Jesus. My Jesus, my Jesus, leaning on my Jesus, leaning on my Jesus. My Jesus, my Jesus, leaning on my Jesus, leaning on my Jesus. My Jesus, my Jesus, leaning on my Jesus, leaning on my Jesus. My Jesus, my Jesus, leaning on my Jesus, leaning on my Jesus, my Jesus, my Jesus, leaning. Next up, we're going to sing Encourage My Soul. Encourage my soul and let us journey on. For the night is dark, and I am far from home. Thanks be to God, the morning light appears. Encourage my soul, and let us journey on. For the night is dark, and I am far from home. Thanks be to God, the morning light appears. The storm is passing over, don't you know the storm is passing over? The storm is passing over, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. The storm is passing over, don't you know the storm is passing over? The storm is passing over, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. The storm is passing over. The storm is passing over. The storm is passing over. Hallelujah. Nelson and this morning I have the opportunity and privilege of doing communion and so when I take time to reflect on the cross and what it means to me um, I take time to think about who I used to be and who I am now and so before when I was back in the world um, I was always self-righteous and so although no one saw me sinning um, I was always sinning in my heart um, I would fear just being vulnerable having all of my emotions pent up just um, fearing expressing myself because I would think of other people's opinions and think about what they would think about me. And so I would just hold my emotions in. And it's just been a struggle for me because I felt like I was bounded um, by me wanting to control how the front that I put up in front of people. I was bounded by just my insecurities overall. And so there were many times where I was just envious in my heart. I remember in school, I always wanted to be at the top. And if I wasn't at the top, I would be envious of my friends or other people because they would get the praise that I thought I deserved. And so there were many times where I just didn't, I didn't want to be envious. Nobody wants to be envious of their friends, but I didn't know how to mask that. I didn't know how to um, put up a good front in front of them. And so instead, I would just distance myself. And when I distanced myself, I kind of disregarded their feelings and just thought about me, you know, just thought about my wants, like how I wanted to feel, just trying to control 
how I wanted them to see me. And so there were many other times you know, where I would just reek of pessimism, just thinking that no one around me, my friends, um, we just didn't deserve better. We just, um, there was just no hope for us. And so I thought that character was just built in me, you know, I thought that that was just in my nature. Um, but instead, I just chose to live that way. And so when I think about who I am now, I think of Romans 12, verse 2. And it says, Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. So when I look up the Greek word of the phrase by renewing, it is translated to enikinosis, which means a renewal, renovation, a complete change for the better. So when I think of the cross, I think of transformation. I think of renewal. I think of Jesus dying on the cross for me just so that I can have a chance to change for the better. Um, I'm even more transformed by his word. And just when I read his word, I see Jesus' character. I see his heart. I see that he's the perfect person that I'm supposed to imitate. And so that's what I strive to be. You know, Jesus... Even though God gave him all the authority on earth, um, he never took advantage of his people. He never took advantage of his, po um, his power. Jesus had love and compassion for people. Um, even before going to the cross, he was troubled. He was troubled. He didn't want to go to the cross, but instead he prayed that God's will came before his. And so as a disciple, um, I choose not to be envious, but content where God has me. I choose not to be selfish, but instead um, be a servant to everyone, just as Jesus was. And now you can join us um, by taking some time to reflect on the body of Jesus Christ that represents the bread and his blood that was spilled on the cross that represents the juice. Jesus is Lord, my Redeemer, how He loves me, how I love Him, He is risen, He is coming, Lord come Brandon, and now that we've had a time to reflect on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, 
we're going to take a look at a contribution message this morning. So let's turn our Bibles to Malachi chapter 3. And this is the part of service where we talk about our monetary contribution to the Lord, what it means to give back to Him and devote to Him financially. Malachi chapter 3, we're going to start in verse 6. It reads, I, the Lord, do not change. So you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. And now I love this passage because it talks about our devotion to God and really talks about the heart of giving back to Him. And I think it's so important how it details the difference of giving to Him just because, or giving to him to test him and push the limits of God. And this is actually the only time in the Bible where God commands his people to test him. And it's not to test him with committing sin, right? But it's to test him in our giving to him. How special is that? And now the challenge is to give financially to God because we love God more than we love our money. Now there's an important distinction, right? Because just as we have our weekly monetary contribution, we also have our special missions contribution. And special missions, as indicated, is very special. And it's actually about to end in one month. And these funds, if you don't know, they go towards supporting missionaries who are out in third world countries. We've just been planting churches in so many places to spread the gospel, such as Hong Kong, also Johannesburg, South Africa, and Lagos, Nigeria. We just planted a church in um, Amsterdam. And there are just so many places that have to be reached with the gospel. I want to encourage you, let's stay faithful to God. Let's test God by how much we give. I know some of us have received our stimulus checks. Others have received financial aid from the University of Florida. And guys, God is just making the money come from everywhere. Let's give our hearts back to Him. Let's give our wallets back to Him. And let's stay faithful and loyal to God and test Him in the amount that we give back to Him. Thank you so much. And make sure to donate using the description, uh, the link in the description below. There's a PayPal link as well as a Venmo username, so feel free to donate to either one of those. And that being said, we're going to have a song. Next up, we're singing Home in Heaven on page 607. Face to face, in heaven, in heaven, I've got a home in heaven, in heaven, in heaven, I've got a home in heaven, in heaven, in heaven, I've got a home in heaven, in heaven, in heaven, I've got a home in heaven, in heaven, in heaven, I've got a home
again. Uh, you know, uh, I'm a dad. And I have two incredible daughters. And uh, one of the things that I really love and uh, warms my heart, makes me feel loved, is when my daughters are obedient to me. Uh, there's nothing better. Those of you who are parents uh, probably can relate to this quite a bit. You know, if your kids just, uh, you know, you ask them to do something and they just kind of piddle around and, and don't end up doing it, it, it you feel that deeply. Uh, but if they uh, get up right away and they're obedient to your direction, uh, you're 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 proud. You're you feel loved, and you feel like, man, my children are awesome. <laughs> uh, it's the same way with God. God expects and desires us to be obedient to Him. So look over in John chapter fourteen and verse twenty-three. We'll get the title of our lesson here. But it says, Jesus replied. Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. The title of the lesson today is to love God is to obey Him. To love God is to obey Him. You know, God requires our obedience, and the Bible says that it's how we communicate our love to God. Obedience to God means repenting and transforming ourselves when we find areas in our lives that are disobedient to God. Romans 12, chapter 2 says, uh, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but to be transformed to the renewing of your mind. To renew your mind is to have a change in mindset. To stop conforming to your patterns your, of your sinful life and to transform yourself to be obedient to God. True obedience takes great faith. It takes a lot of efforts and the decision to want to please God in your life. Turn over with me to 1 Samuel chapter 15. And uh, we'll get into our first point this morning. The point number one is partial obedience is the same as disobedience. 1 Samuel, uh, Samuel chapter uh, 15, you know, God uh, gives King Saul instruction to go and destroy the Amalekites, who were enemies of God's people. God's instructions put them to death. All the men, the women, the children, and even their livestock. Don't leave any of it alive. Destroy it all. Completely destroy everything that belongs to them. You know, the Bible doesn't give a lot of fluff. Uh, you know, when God commands something, He expects complete obedience. It's, His commands are always very specific and they're very radical uh, because uh, they're designed to shake our core and to remove us from the pattern of this world to be obedient to Him. 
when it comes to our sin, God doesn't say, hey, you know, take your time. You know, make sure you set up a good process to really allow you to be successful in your attempt to remove this sin from your life. No, God says, hey, you need to repent or perish. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out because it's better to enter uh, heaven maimed than to enter eternal life with your complete body. Now, this is a bit extreme. Jesus obviously doesn't want us to cut our arms off. Uh, but it's, it's the idea of being radical to rid your life of sin. To remove yourself from the environments or relationships or temptations that lead us into our sin and support our sinful nature. God is very radical and he's unsentimental towards the sin in our lives. I hope you are the same with your own sin. You know, Saul, uh, King Saul sets out here and musters together all of Israel's army to be obedient to God. And we pick up here in verse 7. The Bible says, Then Saul attacked the Amalekites all the way from uh, Havilah to Shur, near the eastern border of Egypt. He took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive, and his people he totally destroyed with the sword. But Saul and the army spared Agag and the best of the sheep and cattle, the fat calves, the lambs, everything that was good. These they were unwilling to destroy completely. But everything that was despised and weak, they totally destroyed. The word of the Lord came to Samuel, I regret that I have made Saul king. Because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. Samuel was angry and he cried out to the Lord all that night. You know, Saul was willing to go so far. But the Bible says he was not willing to be completely obedient to God's direction. Samuel the prophet comes to confront Saul on his disobedience. And we'll pick up here in verse 18. The Bible says, And he sent you on a mission, saying, Go and completely destroy these wicked people, the Amalekites. Wage war against them until you have wiped them out. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? Saul's response, But I did obey the Lord, verse 20. I went on the mission that the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites. And brought back Agag their king. The soldiers took the sheep and cattle from the plunder. The best of what was devoted to God. In order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God at Gilgal. You know at this point Saul's making excuses of course. He's blame shifting. Oh the, the, the soldiers did that. You know and he's just. Uh, I don't believe even really fully aware of his disobedience to God. He thinks that, you know, at this point, uh, he is being obedient because he thinks that his idea is better than God's. You know, too many times in our life, we can feel like, you know, God, that sounds like a great idea, but I've got a better one. Check this out. Uh, what if we do this instead, God? What if, you know, instead of doing that, you know, it would work, but, you know, this is better for me. And Saul, you know, it's like, Man, I'm just going to bring out back Agag. What a prize that would be to capture this king. Uh, all these good sheep and cattle, we're going to bring them back and sacrifice them to God in this big uh, celebration. I spared the best because I'm going to give them to God. And you see, Saul was partially obedient to God, only up to the point that made sense to him in his mind. Sometimes God's uh, direction might not make sense to us, but we need to be completely obedient all the time. We need to all come to a conviction that partial obedience is the same as disobedience. It doesn't matter if you're obedient to God in some areas. If you're not completely obedient, the Bible says you're disobedient. You know, if I told you, uh, if I told one of my daughters, hey, go, go take out the garbage, please. 
and she goes and you know she she pulls it out of the can and ties it up and uh, sets it right there by the can, but then goes off and does something else and uh, leaves it doesn't doesn't take it out to the to the uh, trash can to go out to the curb. Uh, you know there was partial obedience there, but she didn't do it. She was disobedient to the direction because partial obedience is the same as disobedience. Even if we have the intention to be obedient, but don't follow through. Let's continue here in verse 24. The Bible says, Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. See, he's starting to feel conviction in his heart. I have violated the Lord's command and your instructions. I was afraid of the men, and so I gave in to them. Now I beg you to forgive my sin and come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to him, I will not go back with you. You have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you as king over Israel. You know, Saul reveals the truth behind his disobedience, and it was simply because he feared the men that God had called him to lead. Therefore, he failed to lead the people. You know, this caused him to disobey God. For he allowed the fear to prevent him from his obedience. God had called him not only to be obedient himself, but to lead the men to be righteous and obedient as well. You know, for those of us as leaders in God's kingdom, we got to make sure we don't conform and we don't give in and, and lower God's standard so that uh, other people around us will, be, uh, will accept us. we got to preach the word and we got to call people back to the standard of the scriptures because it's God's word. God's word that matters, and if we allow people to be partially obedient, we're allowing them to be disobedient to God. If you're only being partially obedient to God, it's time to repent. It's time to renew your mind and be completely obedient to God's word and his direction for your life. Point number two is being deceived is no excuse for disobedience. Let's look over in 1 Kings chapter 13. 1 Kings is right after 2 Samuel. 1 Kings chapter uh, 13. And we pick up here, you know, God sends a prophet to King Jeroboam to deliver a message. But there was specific directions for the man of God, the prophet, as well. Let's pick up here in uh, in verse 7, chapter 13. The prophet's delivers the message to King Jeroboam. And then in verse 7 it says, The king said to the man of God, Come home with me for a meal, and I will give you a gift. But the man of God answered the king, Even if you were to give me half your possessions, I would not go with you. Nor would I eat bread or drink water here. For I was commanded by the word of the Lord. You must not eat bread or drink water or return the way you came. So he took another road and did not return by the way he had come to Bethel. Now there was a certain old prophet living in Bethel, whose sons came and told him all that the man of God had done there that day. They, were also told, uh, they also told their father what he had said to the king. The father asked, which way did he go? And his sons showed him which road the man of God from Judah had taken. So he said to his sons, saddle the donkey for me. And when, uh, and when they had saddled the donkey for him, he mounted it and rode after the man of God. He found him sitting under an oak tree and asked, Are you the man of God who has come from Judah? I am, he replied. So the prophet said to him, Come home with me and eat. The man of God said, I cannot turn back and go with you, nor can I eat bread or drink water with you in this place. I have been told... By the word of the Lord, you must not eat bread or drink water there or return by the way you came. You see, God instructs him to deliver a message to the king. But hey, while you're there, don't eat, don't drink, and don't, and don't return the same way. Take a different route home. Therefore, the man of God delivers the message. And even when offered, uh, declines the invitation for a meal with the king. And starts to take a different route back. This was no small task. Any, 
any uh, meal with the king would have been pretty uh, lavish and, and, and an incredible uh, honor to be a part of. But the man of God has deep convictions and is completely obedient to God's word. I would imagine by this time in his journey, he's very hungry, very thirsty. Uh, maybe uh, he came to Bethel by the shortest route, and now to return by a different way, he needs to take the longer way home. Maybe he doesn't understand why God told him to do these things, but he has the conviction to be completely obedient to God and to not let temptation get in the way. Let's pick up here in verse 18 and see uh, if he continues in this conviction. The Bible says, The old prophet answered, I too am a prophet, just as you are. And the angel said to me by the word of the Lord, Bring him back with you to your house, so that he may eat bread and drink water. But he was lying. So the man of God returned with him and ate and drank in his house. You know, up to this point, the man of God is completely obedient to God's word and doesn't give in to a single temptation. But unfortunately, he allows someone else to deceive him into disobeying God. That's why it's so important to literally read our Bibles every day, to open up God's Word in our life, to dig in the Scriptures so that we can get our conviction from God's Word and not from people's opinions, uh, to not be, allow ourselves to be swayed by different theologies, different thoughts, uh, whatever might sound a little bit easier or more comfortable for us, we have to make sure that we obey God's word and his direction. And I hope you're taking notes this morning uh, as you watch this sermon uh, so that you can go back and solidify your convictions by the Bible and not by what I have to say. Acts 17, 10 through 12, many of us are familiar with it, but it talks about the Berean uh, Jews having a more noble character. And it describes that this noble character is of those who examine the scriptures Every day to see if what people say is true. They didn't just take Paul's word for it. They, they took God's word for it. The man of God, he has God's word. But he chose to believe man's word over God's. You know, eternity is far too important to take someone else's word for it other than God's. That's why whether you're studying the Bible with someone whether you're teaching them how to be a disciple of Jesus, or if you're discipling or mentoring someone, you need to make sure that you open the Bible and give them God's words and not your own. You know, even if you're using godly principles, you want that person that you're teaching and training to get their convictions from God uh, so that when, when you're, maybe you're not there, they can go back to the scriptures and, and stand firm on the convictions they have from God's word. You know, there's so many different er ideas, uh, different theologies, and even denominations of Christianity. It's enough to confuse uh, the most pure-hearted person who's seeking God. The only way to know the truth is to open up the Bible, to open up God's Word, and to allow God to speak to us. Unfortunately, the man of God, he allowed himself to be deceived by the old prophets. Look in verse 20, we'll continue reading. The Bible says, <clears throat> While you were sitting there, or while they were sitting at the table, the word of the Lord came to the old prophet who had brought him back. He cried out to the man of God who had come from Judah, This is what the Lord says. You have defied the word of the Lord, and have not kept the command of the Lord your God. You, gave, uh, you came back and ate bread and drank water in the place where he told you not to eat or drink. Therefore your body will not be buried in the tomb of your ancestors. When the man of God had finished eating and drinking, the prophet who had brought him back saddled his donkey for him, and he went on his way. A lion met him on the road and killed him, and his body was left lying on the road, with both the donkey and the lion standing beside it. Some people who passed by saw the body lying there, with the lion standing beside the body, and they went and reported it to the city where the old prophet lived. When the prophet, who had brought him back from his journey, heard, heard it, he said, It is the man of God, 
who defied the word of the Lord. The Lord has given him over to, given him over to the lion which has mauled him and killed him as the word of the Lord had warned him. You know, defying God's word leads to spiritual death. We can't allow false doctrine to deceive us from being obedient to God. You know, the man of God here, he had deep convictions. He understood God's word. He had heard God's word in his heart. And and, and he didn't let sin sway him, temptation to sway him. But when it came to entrust himself to another person, you know what? You seem like a trustworthy person. I'm going to go ahead and, and, and listen to what you say because I think, you know, maybe God is speaking through you. Maybe God is telling you to tell me something right now. And oftentimes in, in our lives, we can just, hey, hey, man, this person looks super trustworthy. And they may have good intentions, but they can deceive us. They can lead us astray because maybe they haven't been deep in the Word of God themselves. So we got to make sure when somebody teaches us, when somebody tries to help us to understand what God wants us to believe, that they're using Scripture and not their opinions. And we got to get into the Word of God ourselves to make sure we're not deceived by false doctrine. Point number three, our final point. Turn over to 2 Kings chapter 5. Point number three is obedience requires the help of others. 2 Kings chapter 5 and verse 1. The Bible says, Now Naaman was commander of the army of Aram. He was a great man in sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who was in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Skip down to verse 9. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan. And your flesh will be restored, and you'll be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out. Uh, Stand and call on the name of the Lord his God. Wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar the rivers of Damascus far better than the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. You know, this man, Naaman, it sounds like he has a lot going for him. God has given him success. He's given him victory. But he had an issue. He had leprosy. Leprosy is a disease that leads to a disfiguration and a loss of sensation. It would have affected Naaman's quality of life. And eventually, it would be the cause of his death. There was a far worse disease spread throughout the world, affecting the quality of people's lives and leading to their spiritual death, and that's sin. Sin rots our hearts. It disfigures our convictions and numbs our consciences. Without the help of other disciples, we remain infected and disobedient to God. You know, without the servant girl pointing Naaman to, uh, to God's prophets, to the man of God, there was literally no hope for him. The, the disease would have continued to spread and taken his life. Amazingly enough, when Naaman receives God's direction from Elisha, he gets angry. He, and he doesn't intend to obey because it didn't align with his expectations. He's, can you believe like uh, finding a cure for your disease and being like, ah, eh, man, I'm, I'm t- ticked off because that's not what you're supposed to do. You're not supposed to tell me to do it this way. You're supposed to tell me to do it this way. And he anticipated this uh, grand uh, display where Elisha would come out and, and, and kind of stand before him and wave his arms and be like, Oh, by the power of God, you're healed! You know, he had these expectations, but Elisha didn't even go out to see him. He said, hey, you can just go tell him to dip in, in the Jordan, you know, uh, seven times and he'll be healed. 
And this dude's like, Naaman's like, what in the world? This, that's a nasty river. I'm going to go, what about the Abana or the Farpar? They're so nice. They're refreshing. Why, why are you going to tell me to go and dip in this river? But he has no intention to be obedient. And here's his chance to be obedient to God, but his pride almost doesn't allow him to be obedient. Let's continue reading here in verse 13. The Bible says, Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God told him. And his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. You know, thankfully... Naaman had people in his life to help him be completely obedient to God. We understand that it required Naaman to be 100% obedient for him to be healed. To dip himself seven times in the Jordan River so that he could be healed. You know, imagine the faith uh, that would be required, be needed to continue to dip himself seven times. You know, dip. Man, there's no no change. Nothing's different. Dip, dip. Oh man, I'm still not healed. Is this going to work? Dip, dip, dip. And he's six times, he's like, I don't know. I mean, this is what he told me, but nothing's changing. Dip, the seventh time. Oh my gosh. It's a miracle. The leprosy is gone. I'm healed. And we know Naaman was grateful to God for healing him. The Bible is very clear on that. He wants to worship God for the rest of his life. And if we read on, he goes back to Elisha to offer him a gift. But I bet that he was pretty thankful, pretty grateful for those who helped convince him, hey, just be obedient to God. You know, I'm super thankful for the people that God has put in my life to help me remain completely obedient to God. My wife, Amelia, you know, uh, it's a funny thing about your spouse. They see it all. <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, people at church, uh, your, your friends, the rest of your family, uh, you know, you can, you can uh, look pretty good uh, at all times. But, you know, your wife, your husband, they see all the gunk, right? And so they're able to call you back to the standard of God because they see more of your character than other people. That's who we spend the most of our time with. I'm thankful for my wife who, uh, because she loves God, because she loves me, she wants me to be obedient to God and continues to call me back to the standard when I uh, get off to a little bit of partial obedience on the side. I'm grateful for Marcel and just his heart to continue to disciple me, to challenge me, and to call me to be completely obedient to God. Grateful for men like Mike Patterson, Matt Sullivan, Steve Middleton, who, uh, you know, he's, he's the one who's here in Gainesville, and he, he's, he's incredible at asking the questions to dig in, in my heart. You know, Marcel disciples me, he mentors me, but he's in Miami. I could, uh, you know, tell him whatever I wanted to. I, I don't. I, I have the desire to please God, to be obedient to him. But Steve is very good at asking the important questions, the tough questions to dig in my heart, to just make sure that, My relationship with God is going well because he understands that God has called me to lead his people in Gainesville and he's going to make sure that I'm doing well spiritually. And I love my brother. I'm grateful for his friendship. You know, even the campus guys I disciple want to see me be obedient to God the rest of my life. Uh, We have incredible D groups, uh, you know, typically uh, once a week, once every other week. And, uh, you know, we get open about our sin, we get open about our struggles, and we talk about different ways we can glorify God through our lives. And I hope you're equally as grateful for the men or the women in your life that call you to be completely obedient to God. We're all familiar with Matthew 28, verse 20, that where Jesus instructs us as disciples to teach uh, those people that we disciple, we baptize, to obey everything. That Jesus commands. That's not just, hey, just teach them my commands. No, you, you call people to obedience to God's word and to the scriptures. That's the importance of discipling. It's the importance of spiritual mentorship. We have to make sure that each other, we're obeying God's word completely. 
You know, if you haven't thanked those people lately, the people who help you to obey God, or even if you have, I hope you take time today to express your gratitude for their devotion to help you obey God. You know, in closing, to show our love for God is to be obedient to Him. Remember, partial obedience is the same as disobedience. Of course, we must be on our guard against false doctrine and to obey God's word rather than other people. And we need to be humble towards God and those working to help us to be obedient to God when they challenge us and confront our sin. And to God be the glory. Amen. We will now be singing even greater things. Take what I've been given. Take what I've been given. Make it multiply. Make it multiply. Take this life I'm living. Take this life I'm living. Make it touch the sky. Make it touch the sky. You can take us higher. You can take us higher. Than we've ever been. Than we've ever been. Lord, you will inspire. Lord, you will inspire. Lord, you always win. Lord, you always win. Even, Even greater things, things that have been, been done, done before. before. Think what we have done and making more Even greater things that have been done before Even greater things to Christ the Lord Giant was so mighty Over nine feet tall David looked so tiny He seemed so very small but your hand was with him, the hand was with him. And, the stone he slung. and the stone he slung. You gave him the vision, you gave him the vision. and through you he won. And through you he won. Even, Even greater, greater things, things that have, have been done before. before. Take what we have done and, and make it more. Even greater things, things that have been done before. Even greater things to Christ the Lord. It was just a pebble. It was just a pebble. That made Goliath fall. That made Goliath fall. I must be more faithful. I must be more faithful. I must give my all. I must give my all. I see what you can do. I see what you can do. With the stone and sling. Take this life I give you. Take this life I give you. And take my everything. Take my everything. Even, Even greater, greater things, things that have been, been done before. before. Take what, what we have, have done, done and make it more. Even, Even greater, greater things, things that have been, been done before. before. Even, Even greater, greater things to Christ the Lord. Lord. Even, Even greater, greater things that have been done before. Take what we have done and make it more. Even greater things that have been done before. Even greater things to Christ the Lord.